PRS Foundation presents the Virtual Talent Development Conference um, with the subject Conversations in Talent Development. Um, the conference this year will consist of a series of morning seminars and virtual networking sessions presented with contributions from our network of talent development partners. This year will be focused on reimagining and reframing an, an inclusive and equitable future for the music industry, exploring possibilities of international con connectivity and looking at how our talent development network has sustained creative development in a challenging landscape. This panel is about using data for equitable recovery. See, a lot of long words that I'm, I'm getting asked to, to say today. The capture of diversity, equality, and inclusion data can be very personal and a sensitive topic. Many funders, including PRS Foundation, use data as a way of identifying gaps in music creator support and to find ways to break down barriers so that underrepresented talent can fulfill their potential and forge long-term successful careers. In this session, we're going to be hearing from organizations that are integral to building a stronger, connected, and more sustainable music community through authentic representation of the music creators they work with and how a better understanding of the people behind the organizations ensure better outcomes for all. I'm really happy to be the moderator of this. My name is Yao Wusu. I'm the Senior Manager of Power Up and Executive Manager at the Playmaker Group. And I'm going to be speaking to these lovely people about what they do and, um, and find more about what they do in their organisations and how it relates to the subject of data and diversity. Um, can we start off maybe with Yvette, who I've been hearing so many wonderful things about and um, yeah it'd be good to hear a little bit more about you your journey and what you do at Jazz Refresh. Okay um hi everybody um yeah I don't think we've got enough time to talk about my journey <laughs> with the amount of years on this planet and, and channels I've gone through but uh, what I will say is my background actually isn't in music believe it or not my background actually was in theatre I kind of came through the ranks in theatre management, business management in theatre, operations management, etc. Um, then jumped into corporate hospitality, worked at uh, Madame Tussauds, head of events at the London Eye, really kind of gained a really good business management grounding in the leisure and entertainment industries and arts. Um, and uh, as a consultant, I was um, a punter at Jazz Refreshed, and the short version is I offered my services free of charge to kind of help them get on the fundraising ladder, even though I wasn't a fundraiser at the time. And um, it was and we are a not-for-profit so to say I'm a partner you know there's not a financial implication to that um so while I've been with Judge Refreshed it's been all about um it's been all about kind of just you know expanding the platforms um and really kind of embedding the foundations of the organization um so that we can really extend our reach in supporting diverse and or young and or female artists in UK jazz and I think over the last let's say seven years we've done a pretty good job of that even though the company is a lot older than that um really when we got the Arts Council funding that was when we were able to accelerate everything and then you know becoming a, a PRSF talent development partner really kind of embedded that and really helped us grow the festival specifically um and continue with the talent development that we've been doing with artists providing opportunities for emerging and mid-scale artists. Does that kind of give you a basic introduction as to who I am and, and what I'm doing? A very interesting journey as well. Yes. Uh, we'll come back and chat more in a sec. Over to you, Rich. Tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and Attitude is Everything. Hey, thanks for having me and nice to see everyone. Um, so yeah, I work for a music organisation called Attitude is Everything. Um, we're a disability-led organisation. Um, we've been supporting the music industry for... Uh, this would be our 20th anniversary year, but we sort of pushed that back. Actually, it would have been last year. We pushed it back to this year, but maybe we'll have to push back again. Uh, okay, got to be able to have a party properly to celebrate these things, I think. Um, but anyway, so we're in our 20th year um, and uh, we've been supporting the music industry predominantly in the live events area. So um, with venues and festivals for how uh, deaf and disabled people can... Um, 10 gigs, uh, concerts and events um, as fans. But in the last um, couple of years, I launched a um, new initiative called Next Stage, which is looking at removing the barriers for deaf and disabled artists, musicians, DJs and producers. 
uh, within the music industry. Um, so looking to really just seek out uh, a kind of industry where all artists are developing at the same rate, you know, whether they're going to go on to be successful or not be successful. You know, everyone should just have the opportunity to, um, uh, you know, succeed and fail uh, at the same chance of that. Um, but previously is working at Cheese Everything. I used to work in radio at the BBC. I worked at Radio One, Six Music. Um, and before that, I was running a music festival uh, from the age of 16. So I sort of came into the music industry and, and learned, learned, uh, learned the tough way because running a festival is a very un unforgiving process. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, it's two years into this uh, next stage project and um, that's really given me a um, uh, kind of bit of an eye-opener of, uh, of what's going on with, uh, with artists and, and artist development. And um, it's great to be at um, Actually's Everything where we sort of plug into what other people are doing, like yourselves at PRS Foundation, and we are able to support um, the already ongoing parts of the music industry to, um, to be accessible and to um, support people to, um, yeah, just enable artists to succeed or fail at the same rate. Wicked. Thanks, Rich. Um, let's go to Hannah. All the way from Northern Ireland. Tell, tell us more about what you do. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Uh, so my name is Hannah Richardson. Um, I'm a rep representative from Safe and Sound, which is a collective of six women who all come from a music background. Uh, the organisation aims to promote um, and provide better support and connectivity for people working within the music sector in Northern Ireland. Um, and aim to promote equality and diversity in doing so. Um, we only launched this year. So we're quite new in comparison to some of the other collectives mentioned, um, but it's just all about um, how to better support artists and musicians um, working within the music sector um, and how to better connect them and how to support them in that way. So that's us. <laughs> so we'll find out more. Uh, last but definitely not least, Abel. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Abel Selaudrin. I'm a cellist, singer and a composer. Um, it's nice to be around these like diverse organizations because basically I am a musician that plays uh, between a couple of genres. Uh, I grew up in South Africa and I went to school, uh, uh, to music school in a place called Soweto. Uh, we're learning classical music, so playing the cello. And um, uh, I came to the Royal Northern College to study, uh, studied classical music, played all the concertos, played all the serious stuff, and actually ended up uh, creating uh, a version of myself that's kind of always been there, but I didn't know uh, of, of, of kind of getting to African music and making it a part of, of my language. Um, and so, so these worlds kind of collided as part of my DNA, so I can't really take one away from the other. And I've just become this uh, musician that, that plays between these genres. Um, so I've, I've been very lucky to work with, with different uh, organizations and different musicians, such as the Art Ensemble of Chicago, uh, the BBC Philharmonic and the BBC Concert Orchestra. So very different worlds uh, and, and just trying to fit in through the cracks with, with my own DNA and not trying to uh, be a part of, of any train, but, but my own. That's amazing intro. And I, I think it leads into my first question, which is very broad, but I'd love you all to kind of feed into it, is what are your thoughts on the importance of inclusion and representation in the music industry, you know, from your specific point of view? And um, let's start with you, Abel, and we'll go back the reverse way we've done the intros. So Abel, start Sorry, with can, can you just repeat the question just once more, please? Yeah, what are your thoughts on the importance of inclusion and representation? within the UK music industry? Yeah, I mean, coming from South Africa, you know, we, we came from a place where um, apartheid was, was separating people quite literally. Um, and so uh, we, we had young, young kids learning classical music, uh, you know, from the age of seven and six as, as a form of protest to what we were being told that we, we, we couldn't be a part of. So, um, uh, coming to the UK has, has made me realize that actually um, there's uh, more of a, of a need for that, you know, for that the same type of education where, where we're told that actually uh, it doesn't mean if, if you don't see somebody that looks like you in this sector that you can't be in this sector. Um, so, so part of my, my lifelong ambition is to, is to make 
people realize that they, they are allowed uh, to be, you know, in, um, uh, in, in these places, the concert halls, you know, of, of classical music where, where it's, it's actually a, a place of freedom rather than a place of, of restriction uh, and uh, to change how people should see that. So um, I think creating, you know, those kind of environments uh, and and um, uh, being more brave, you know, uh, to to be a part of those places is is quite important for me. So um, there's still a way to go. I feel it, it, in in the UK, um, especially in the in the classical music sector, to having you know people uh, of 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 color as, as part of the community. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but I think it's important uh, to come with your own identity and not come uh, to change, you know, uh, yourself. So I, I think um, that's what I'm trying to do within my music and that's who I'm trying to access. You know, I'm trying to access people who, who are like me, uh, who speak like me, who look like me, uh, to come listen to classical music, but also a flavor of something that they, they may remember uh, from the back of their minds. So, yeah. Thank you very much. We'll go over to Hannah next. Your yeah. thoughts? Um, so I come from a music background as well myself. So I play in um, a three-piece um, rock band with two other women. Um, and I think, you know, whenever we started, it was, I'm, I'm from um, a small city in Northern Ireland, but um, it was just like, you know, an all white guy club that was making this kind of music. So it was really hard to kind of find, um, you know, people who, like I totally understand what you mean, Abel, about people who look like you and, um, you know, getting that influence so that you can kind of find your scene and kind of move on with what you want to do. So yeah, like the influence is like a huge part of it. But whenever we started, like we didn't even know the kind of music that we wanted to play. We didn't know if we wanted to play rock music. We didn't know what kind of instruments we wanted to play. Like one of our first practices was us literally all just kind of sit on the floor and like, you know, we had like a keyboard and guitar and we were like, like we don't know who wants to play what, do you know what I mean? But um, and that was because for me, I believe it was because a lack of, you know, influence of people who were like us um, and, and definitely who looked like me and a lack of people, people of color who were making um, that kind of music in my city. Um, and I think like, you know, now we're just sort of starting to find our own sound and kind of trying to work out what kind of music that we want to play. And I hope that that is you know, people can can look at my band and be like, look like me and or look like the other girls and, and take influence from that. And, you know, think, well, you know what, if they're doing that, so can I, because I feel like that was the thing that, that sort of held me back at the start. Like I was kind of like, you know, you do look at like the scene around you and you kind of go, oh, well, I don't know if I can, it can fit into that box. But I hope that that is starting to shift now and that we're see we're starting to see like more people of color coming to the front and, and making noise and more women coming to the front and starting to make noise. Um, and, you know, I just hope that that's the thing to set it all up um, and just encourage a lot more people to do the same. Do you, do you feel like that is happening with, with your band and just the work that you're doing? Do you think it's have already having a, a, an impact? Definitely, you know, um, whenever we started, I think there was maybe um, maybe two or three other all female bands that I knew in the country. And now we're starting to see like a huge shift in, in the, the dynamic, um, which I think is amazing to see. I don't think we're there yet. I think it's not, you know, 50-50, um, especially not in indie rock music. You know, it still is pretty much like, um, a white boys club like I'm going to just say it but um, I do think that it is starting to change like I think that this is the start of something. Great great Rich over to you and um, what do you think the importance of inclusion and representation is to the UK music industry? I think um, I always think about it um, with my work that one of the reasons when I work with other organizations and I, I try and you know make help them be more inclusive is because like artistically the like cultural pool of music is only going to be improved i think and more interesting with like different people producing music um 
you know, if you have the same people, the same life courses, experience making the same music, it's, you know, where's, where's the fun in that? And um, I always, you know, I, I think that is the basic part of it is that like, there's some great music that could be, is going to be made by some unique voices that have had unique experiences um, and have perhaps got a bit of other motivation as well behind their, their um, career or whatever you want to call it, because with a lot of the artists that I connect with through um, Next Stage, so they may be disabled artists or they may not identify as disabled but have lived experience of impairment or like a health condition, they sort of wrestle with the like idea of if they, they want to be like a trailblazer because there are so few other voices in, in the industry um, who get to a certain level and can talk about those experiences. And it's um it's it's interesting and unfortunate that like that has to be a kind of struggle for those artists whether they want to uh kind of fly the flag um so to speak and um I think that's what, why really it is important that you know these people are never um these artists are not, never really like held up or slowed down or knocked off their confidence because um that could be uh, they could be like really really important for other artists as well um and i think especially in the area that i'm working in with disabled artists i think that when you've got people um going ahead and pushing forward and progressing and other people can see that and be inspired by it um i think it's it's yeah it's really really valuable thanks very much rich uh yvette over to you same question uh, what's the importance of inclusion and representation within the uk music industry well, it's vitally important, really. Um, I mean, Jazz Refreshed exists because of the imbalance of diversity and inclusion that existed 18 years ago. The company is 18 years old now. Um, the founders, you know, lovers of jazz and all sorts of other types of music would go to jazz events and be, A, the only black faces in the room. And very often the, the cultural expression on stage was very, very limited. There weren't necessarily, you know, there was a whole pool of talent that weren't being let onto the main, main gatekeeper's stages at the time. I mean, we're now in a position when everybody's caught up. You know, they decided we will do for self, you know, and, and created a platform where young, black, and or female artists would be given a stage, would be given you know, a, a great spot where they could hone their talents, where people could come and see them, where they could cultivate with audiences. But also, you know, as I was saying, it's about bringing in diverse audiences as well. You know, there was a lack of cultural diversity in the audience. Audience. And so, you know, coming from the backgrounds that they did, the musical backgrounds that they did, they marketed in a different way and they brought in some people would be very surprised when they see the scene as it looks today, um, you know, much more diverse, many female band leaders, etc. You know, it's because the likes of Jazz Refreshed and other, other small organisations were trying to not only hone the talent, but provide kind of opportunities for the talent. You know, it's so, so important. Kind of tapping into what Abel was saying about kind of the, the challenges within classical as well. You know, those same challenges existed within, within jazz. Of late, sorry, I'm going to name drop a little bit. Um, during lockdown, during coronavirus, during the unfortunate incident with um, George Floyd that has put a spotlight onto kind of the black plight around the world, um, an organization has been born called Black Lives in Music. And their focus really is about um, working with educational institutions, working with ensembles um, and orchestras in jazz and classical to really try and encourage them and help them find ways to redress specifically the cultural imbalances that kind of exist so you know any talent development partner out there any organization broader than that please check out black lives in music engage with them and see how they can help you to redress any inequalities that you're aware of or not aware of in your organization but yeah i mean the importance of it's 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 kind of what rich was saying in terms of it really creates a more interesting um landscape you know, culturally, sonically, et cetera, if we're bringing in different voices, different sounds with different experiences to this landscape. Thank you very much, Yvette. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think in, um, we all agree that, you know, sometimes to get to the point of, of change or, you know, whether it be being able to draw down funding or, you know, put forward cases, you know, data and, and facts and figures play a massive part in it. Um, and we'll all know that, you know, when, you, when you're part of a programme or you, you're going for funding, 
there's a lot of boxes that one of you know who's who's engaging who are you where you're from many different cate categories but what are the challenges around data governed by organizations um you know is there a clear benefit are there you know even i think you you mentioned before we we got on to speak about sometimes it's about not not necessarily having the resource to get that information then there's stuff about identity so kind of I want to open up to anybody who wants to speak on it. What are the challenges around data gathering? Can I, can I start seeing as you've called my name? <laughs> um, so, oh my goodness, the challenges are a plenty. Data gathering and having that data is so important. We in the first in the early days of Jazz Refreshed, everything that that we information that we shared was empirical. It was just you know we can see that we have lots of black people attend our events. We can see that we have lots of black people that we program on our stages and quite a few of them are female. You know, um, we are a very small organization. We don't have our own venue. We don't have our own booking system. So we don't have that method of when someone books a ticket, you can just gather that data. So it becomes about the relationships that you have with venues that you go into um and that can be a real challenge to get data from those you know even up to today it can be a real challenge to get that data from from organizations you know as um as an arts council funded organization there are certain tick boxes again that you kind of have to adhere to and one of the things is you have to sign up to um i think it's called the audience agency um and you have to data gather you know so one of the things that we've been able to do is they provide a platform where you know we can create it's kind of a template, but you can add or take away to it. You can create a questionnaire kind of tailored to your business or to your events. And what we do is we send it out to our mailing list. We can't send it out to the people who've booked tickets because we don't have that information, you know, um, unless with data protection, they ticked that box that their information can be shared. We then don't get access to that. So again, a lot of what we do is still we can see um, a lot of what we do is at our weekly event before lockdown and, and our weekly closed, etc. You know, our door person literally has a five bar gates against various different age ranges. So again, it's, it's all kind of, you look like you're between 18 and 25. You know, you look like you're over 35. Um, you know, someone is, most of the time you can tell if someone's black, white, mixed, you know, but there are kind of, then we have our other character um, categories. So, you know, there are so many different ways that we as a small like organization who don't have a lot of resource are having to be kind of savvy with how we do that data collection. For the larger organizations, you know, it's easy to do. They've got their systems, they've got their venues, they're, you know, it's, it's a small organization, it's a real challenge to do that work. So we email out to our mailing list, we'll put it out on social media. If you've attended one of our events, can you please complete this? We need this information to continue receiving our funding. You know, we find ways to get the people who really support what we do to um, kind of respond to that. So it is challenging because we can't, we still can't be as specific as we'd like to be. You know what I mean? Do you find it um, off-putting to some of the audiences to ask for that information? Because obviously they've already engaged, or the music creators, they've already engaged with with your organization or you, you know, to ask them for that favor bit, do, you know, do, you, do people find that intrusive? Do you find that that's the case? Well, um, when, we, when we specifically um, uh, email people and link to our questionnaire, for the number that we email out, we get a very small percentage that actually complete. So I think the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> you know, we've, done, we've had scenarios where during our festival, we've had people walking around with questionnaires, trying to get people to kind of on the spot, kind of give us some data. Um, and it's 50-50, you know, some people, they absolutely love what they're experiencing. So their heart is open to actually responding to the request. Some people just don't want to be bothered by it. You know, it's not important to them. It's important to us. Sure. Rich, you mentioned before about um, you know, some people defining themselves as, you know, having a disability or, or you know, challenges in that space. Is, is a big part of the data gathering process the, the recipient, I suppose, the person completing the information or giving it, how they identify themselves? And in, and in your space, does that become co very complicated? Yeah, um, we, yeah, up until a couple of years ago, we were very, uh, geez, everything, we were kind of very like 
you know, you are, you're a disabled person or a non-disabled person. But when I, um, when I joined and did some research, um, we, we, kind of, we did a survey of about 100 artists in the UK. And what came out of that was that actually, although two thirds of them said they would identify as deaf or disabled, there was another kind of third there who'd say they would only identify sometimes or, or just never at all, even though they had a long-term uh, health condition or impairment. So what, what I, since then as well, I sort of learned that artists, it, it's like they don't, they're not all totally sure on what to do when they when approached with those kind of forms and those kind of questions. Um, it, it may kind of seem like immediate to, to us what we're looking for, but it, it's also not totally clear for an artist about when is the right time sometimes to identify. And also I think um, with, within, within the kind of world of um, artists who've got lived experience of impairment, there's a little bit of a fear about any stigma that might be attached to identifying, um, you know, so, so not knowing, so filling out kind of the data collection form with confidence on, on what's going on with that and the purpose of it I guess is a challenge from both sides. Um, you know how you how you illustrate like the uh, the reason for kind of asking those questions, and and and, and a lot of the time there's really like big positives that come from that. And um, yeah, okay, I think that is a it definitely is a challenge. I think for the artists to um, yeah to navigate navigate what they, when they should and shouldn't be like declaring things and when it's to the benefit of them or not. You know. Yeah. Rich, I'm, Abel, I'm going to come to you in a sec because I'm keen to see how you feel as a, as an artist. But Hannah, who I know is also an artist, but I want to talk about um, Safe and Sound. How, how have you found it to really, uh, you, you know, as a new organisation that's been set up recently in terms of data gathering? And how have you, um, how have you planned to, to use that information that you're getting through? So um, we launched our questionnaire as well. Um, that must have been the summer um, of 2020, um, which I mean, the year of all bad things possible. Like, but um, yeah, so it was all just kind of digital because you know we weren't really able to run you know physical events because all events were cancelled. Um, so a lot of the information that we were gathering were had come in through email or they responded to our questionnaire on our Instagram or our Facebook or any of our socials. Um, and I suppose like amongst ourselves, like there was people who we knew who we could kind of get to follow out the questionnaire. But I really think that it's super, super important. You get the most response whenever you're face to face with someone um, and whenever it's kind of through word of mouth. Um, so that's why I feel like, you know, we didn't really get the amount of responses that we would have wanted, um, especially um, in regards to underrepresented um, communities, um, you know, and I think really that was something that we should have, you know, we, we were expecting in a way because obviously the you know making events and just getting out and speaking to people and being able to put on things like festivals and um just networking events in general are really beneficial to you know um actually been able to explain what the organization is about and um sort of like say who you are um but i suppose like we did still get like a good number of um results but um, maybe not necessarily the people that we were trying to target. Um, but I mean, like data collection is, is super, super important. We now are taking some of that information. Um, so some of the questions that we asked were like, what you know, do you think is holding you back within the industry? Is there anything that you feel like, you know, music, the music sector in Northern Ireland is lacking? Um, what do you feel like we could do better to better support you? Um, and, you know, a lot of things were coming up like connectivity. Um, you know, a lot of people are feeling really isolated, especially with, you know, 2020, like a coronavirus and lockdown and stuff like that, people are feeling like more isolated than they ever have before. So like, I think being able to do things like networking events or something like this, you know, where people can literally log into Zoom and chat to amazing, inspiring people and get to know what, you know, more about the industry and organizations that are out there and available to them um, is super, super important. Um, and, you know, just 
kind of try and do everything that you can in order to make those people people feel better connected in their own community if that yeah. makes sense um so yeah that's <laughs> um over to you Abel um I just want to know from again we you know we talked a lot about organization collecting data as an artist how do you feel when you're approached to you know share data or you're going for funding or a, or a opportunity and then there's all these boxes put in front of you how does that make you feel and do you get do you, do you always understand the purpose of it as well well, I think I probably deal with a lot of things um, on such a micro level than surveys. Like I, I depend on seeing my audience change a lot. Um, and that's how I, I kind of reflect, who did I play for today? You know, that's, that's I ask myself that quite often, you know, um, you know, uh, and so, so when, when these kind of things come across, you know, I, I feel like an individual ticking a box, but I don't feel like there's a lot of us. But whereas when I do play a concert, I get to see it and I get to influence, it, you know. Um, I, I feel very lucky that I, I can place myself, you know, uh, in, at, at the Wigmore Hall in London, as, as well as, you know, go and have a jam with, with Steam Up, you know, or, or I, I feel like I can place myself in these places and fit into both. So I feel lucky in the sense that I, I can start um, influencing people from, from, from different sides to, to maybe, you know, go uh, and, and see a concert elsewhere or, or, or be at a gig. And I, I think uh, in my own practice, it's quite important in order to, to start um, dissolving these boundaries that, you know, like people can't come to this gig. People can't, it's, it's important how I present my own, my own music. Um, you know, it's important that uh, I make sure that uh, people of color feel like they can walk into a place like King's Place or or um, a, a fancy place like that. And to do that, it, maybe in my own concert, I'll break down the barrier of, of of the performer not being seen before the concert, something like this. You know, there's, there's this ritual that you know there's there's us and then there's him and there's it, it's a bit of a pedestal, but it's 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 quite important me for me to be you know out there with, with people and. And see people and welcome people as if I welcome them to my home to host them, rather than I, I welcome them to my home for them to watch me. Um, so that's that's quite important, and, and to give people the you know, you know children can be there, people can speak, people can dance, people can sing, and and people can can ululate. You know, this is even if it's classical music, even if it's Bach. I think creating those different platforms now where 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 people are allowed. Uh, to to be themselves without you know um, without holding back is quite important, and even speaking of you know disabilities and things like that, you know there was a wonderful venue here in Manchester called the Wonder Inn, which is now sadly closed, but you know there, there used to be people coming in and out, an open door policy, you know uh, where you can come in and be playing some Bach or whatever. Somebody would come in and uh, they wouldn't be in their in you know in 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 the in the state of mind where they. They are aware of themselves around people, which is still okay, you know. Uh, but making sure that that platform is safe for myself and for them, and and or actually letting making everybody accept, you know, this. So so being able to see it for me is quite important. I feel like always like when I tick a box, I don't know who else is ticking it, so it doesn't it doesn't make me feel like I see it. But um, um, yeah, I'm 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 constantly working to place myself in in these different groups and and influence people and um. I like to see the results with my eyes and it, it takes time and I see change over time. Um, uh, and so that's that's quite important for me to constantly reflect on. So so you are, because of your, your overall aim, you, you understand the necessity of filling in these questionnaires, sharing data with these organizations. Is, 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 is that basically a means to an end for you? You're happy to do it because you know what the benefit of you being involved will will bring absolutely absolutely yeah I'm, I'm i'm happy to to always say but i i i just want to see it you know i just really want to see it so so um i guess i'm also speaking i mean when you take the box you're speaking from your own experience and um if from a performance point of view i'm also speaking from my own experience you know just sitting on the other side and and, and seeing how, how the numbers are changing so that's that's one of my tallies in in my in my in my own sense 
Thank you very much. Um, Rich, over to you. I want to direct this next question at you. Is um, how can organization use broad uh, organizations use broad data to provide nurturing environments for music creators? Like, how do you, you know, what, what's that skill of being able to take this information or these reports that get put out and, and use it to make sure on the ground for individuals it, it changes their experiences? Yeah, that's really tough. It's, um, yeah, it's quite a journey from collecting, you know, kind of huge empirical numbers and changing that for an individual's experience of your organization. Um, I mean, yeah, we work with yourselves at the PRS Foundation and help musicians and many other, many other funders. Um, and I mean, it, it's quite a long journey because you have to be collecting, you have to be collecting your data and the same, the same data over a period of time to notice um, when you do tweak your practices, what's actually bringing in, um, you know, bringing in more individuals from a certain background or uh, successfully funding or say, for example, more disabled artists, um, if, you, if you've been looking to make your processes more accessible. Um, so it's quite, it's quite a long journey in that sense, but um, you kind of have to marry it up with those tweaks that you're making to your kind of to your practice. And I think that goes beyond, um, you know, when you're collecting someone's data, it might be at the start of an application or some sort of process, but when you're also um, alongside that, promoting your opportunities and the like language you're using um, and the people you're reaching out to to also amplify that promotion. Um, there's probably a bit of a marriage there between that stuff and then hopefully seeing uh, that representation growing, if that was what your target was. Um, yeah, it, it, and, and that, I guess your question was a bit about how would that might benefit um, an individual by like tweaking that practice. That's really, really good question because it's actually quite, quite difficult to summarize um what what the benefits would be but you you'd have to know that if you were receiving more applications or you were hearing from more artists from a certain demographic um that you tweaked your practices and processes in order to make it more accessible to them that um, for them they'd be feeling more more confident um more welcome to be part of that process um and more like they sort of are valid um and validating like artists from back you know um, it's kind of like what we've we've have heard before already today, like that feeling of like being able to move into an area of confidence where maybe people haven't been like you before. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think I think that if you're asking people the right questions um, and and listening to them and then tweaking what you're doing, then um, yeah, a welcoming environment, I guess, is the main benefit to like those individuals. So, so the data essentially is helps inform your practice, but then obviously you've then got to look at how you do the work to ensure that it's better for each individual or group. Is that is yeah. that essentially the challenge? Yeah, I think so. And um, I think it can. I think even that can sometimes come down to like things like even just like language you use when you're collecting the data. I mean, we we one thing that we realize is that like language is not going to always stay the same as it is right now, you know, and, and we'll constantly be learning from our audiences, um, from our networks of artists, from our networks of um, music fans, you know, about, about what they find, uh, what they respond to. And, um, and one thing is accepting um, and like just acknowledging that like you, you won't be able to write a clear maybe set of uh, kind of data um, data types or whatever that might might people might all respond to it's just um, just always kind of fluctuating and a bit more fluid um, especially with disability because you've got a very such a variety of impairment types and and identities that it's uh, it, it's important to like know that you're you know you're not it's not going to be a concrete kind of set of data that you're going to be asking for all the time that's going to work for everybody I hear that, I hear that. Yvette I've got a, a question for you and it kind of goes on the back of what Rich has alluded to um, does data always tell the full story you know does, does the information always tell the full story and and if not what are the challenges around making sure that the you know the full holistic view of whatever the 
the the group or the issue is comes through no i don't think the data can ever tell the full story because it's it's so ABC, do you know what I mean? And there are, you know, I hate to use the term shades of grey in everything, do you know what I mean? It could be, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, it could be that, you know, in, um, in a particular kind of review, data review of performance of an organisation in a particular period, they've not had, I guess I'm actually using Jazzy Fresh as an example, they've not had as many female band leaders. Um, they've not had as many female band leaders as they uh, would have wanted to, had tried to attract, had tried to kind of, you know, work with in any given period of time or in any given, in any given year. Um, that's not to say the work wasn't being done to encourage that flow of talent to work on but the data says zero female you know band leaders you know um, uh, ten percent of musicians worked with in a period of time were kind of females it's you know the data will tell you how many there were but the data doesn't necessarily tell you what work is being done um, successfully or unsuccessfully to actually redress that balance. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, an organization like Jazz Refresh, we're very hands-on, we're very kind of, you know, on the ground. You know, we know what's happening on the scene. We engage with the artists, we engage with the, the talent developers. So the Tomorrow's Worlds and the, the Guild Halls and the Leeds Universities, et cetera. We engage with those to, to know the pipeline that's coming through, to talent spot, to taste make. For, for Jazz Refreshed, it's about, you know, you already have the talent. We're not developing you in that sense. We're providing you experiential opportunities to hone that talent and to actually connect with an audience and begin your career. You know, so there's a whole kind of process that we go through that can't be recorded in data, you know, so. Is there a chance with any of the funders, and obviously don't name any of the funders, but are there a chance with any of the funders who rely too heavily on data when they review the work that you're doing? Um, I've never, mm, actually, no, I'm gonna take that back. <laughs> um, there are definitely points in time where it has just been that, that kind of spot check, let's call it, of not achieving certain areas where it will be marked and, and noted, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? But what's not noted is the work that's being done already to get to that point, you know. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's not affected our funding, but it's certainly been recorded, you know. But I'm sure for some it would affect, it would affect. I think there's the, the, the counterbalance of what we had achieved, you know, was enough for that not to be too major an issue but recorded as something that needed to have improvement in the following period. Hannah um, and, and Abel, I wanted to ask you, you know, as, as musicians and artists and how have your experiences been in relation to, you know, diversity in a lot of organisations, a lot of, you know, maybe projects that have, have and, you know, Abel, I know you worked in, you know, you know with very different organisations in very different spaces. I'm just keen to kind of understand a little bit more about your your own experiences of inclusion and diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want me to go first? Or? Yeah, go on, Hannah. Go for it, yeah. Hannah. Okay. Um, I think, like, as far as, um, you know, help from other organisations goes and stuff, like, for me, um, I think that, you know, providing, uh, like, a safe and nurturing space for... Uh, members of you know an underrepresented community I think that's really good but I also think that we need to remember that like you know that like sometimes it can feel a wee bit like tokenism -y in certain situations and um, you know I, I think it's important for people to kind of learn especially if you're coming in from like an organization perspective to know where that line is and how not to cross it in such a way um you know it, it's it's a, a difficult one like and I I don't even really know the answer to it myself but I know that like it I I find it really like infuriating whenever you know whenever my band are brought in or whatever to do like an interview or whatever and you know the whole the entire conversation isn't about the music the entire conversation is about how we're women and about how you know I'm mixed and how how does that affect 
whatever and I feel like that can take a lot away from you know the actual music experience of it as well like I seen like a really good like quote today on Facebook that was like you know stop asking um you know black folk about their experiences um you know it would be or it would be great to see um if people just ask them about what they like what you did in your organization as opposed to what your experiences are as a person of color in that community and it's like you know that I like I love talking about my own experiences and I'm like all for um you know encouraging other people and being able to educate other people that maybe aren't um familiar with um that aspect but also I don't want other people to think that all women in bands and that all um, mixed people and bands or that all black people and bands are in the same boat because it's not do you know what I mean it's sometimes it's not okay to ask those questions if you don't know a person like of course there's going to be like people that you know think it's okay to want to respond or whatever but don't don't just assume that everyone's the same you know and I, I, I think that that is really important and um, in a way of just being respectful you know and don't you know, like some people have different limitations as to what is acceptable to ask them. And, you know, if you come into that and, and expect more than what the person is prepared to give, I think that that is just a recipe for disaster, honestly. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's like, like a right or wrong answer to that as well. I think it's just really just being able to educate yourself as well as like, you know, an outsider from that type of community and uh, I mean Google's free do you know what I mean there's a plenty of organizations out there that are willing to provide that advice you know so I don't see why more people don't launch into that um, and you know try and get that information for themselves as well. In, in talking about your experience with organizations and, and you know specifically around diversity and inclusion and kind of building on what you said have you ever felt um any tokenism you, have you ever felt that you were using to stat pads to data you know to to build is that ever occurred oh definitely i think like oh like it happens yeah De <laughs> yes is the answer um even as far as you know um where the band goes and stuff like that as well it's like you know sometimes you can like find yourself on like you know a festival lineup or whatever on like you know us as a rock band on like a blues festival lineup or like a country festival lineup with you know where they obviously needed a band to kind of fill the spot maybe they had like a bit of backlash oh there's no you know women on your lineup and suddenly you find yourself amidst all these you know country fellas and it's like you know there was obviously something going on there like somebody was had had obviously said something and I find that in itself extremely problematic you know like at the same time don't put on you know a band if you don't like them aim to be inclusive but make sure that you're finding you know you're, that you're looking and actively you know educating yourself and and finding music that you like from you know people that don't necessarily look like you look for them do you know what I mean don't just like you know, stick your hand in a bucket and like pull out the token, you know, whatever, just look for them. You will find music that you like from, you know, diverse, um, like from a diverse setting. You just have to look for it. It's out there, just look for it, you know. Um, I know like, you know, a lot of festivals are aiming to do, you know, the 50-50 split at the minute as well. And like, some of them are like, you know, well, I'm not gonna, I'll not name the festival in particular, but like a huge festival, and I'm going to mm, not say it, but, you know, and you're looking at that lineup and it's like maybe 8% female. And it's like, you know, if you just look for, um, for bands that are like that and find the ones that you like, rather than just, you know, clutching at straws and trying to whip whatever out of the bucket, like, it's not that hard. <laughs> I, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Abel, what how's what are your experiences been again? You know, what I've what I've read about you and what I've heard about you, you you've worked in some very interesting spaces, some more diverse than others. And yeah, it'd be it'd yeah. be good to know a little bit more about how how that's made you feel and, and what you've got from working in those different spaces. 
I think it's, you know, it's really about finding out um, the core truth of an organization or what everybody is trying to, uh, what the message is of, a, of an organization. Um, uh, a lot of these things in terms of tokenism and stuff um, and, and kind of projecting this in, in, in advertising and all that stuff comes down to like things like funding, you know, them looking for funding. But actually the, the first truth is, is asking, why are you looking for that funding? You know, um, I think it's important for, for different organizations to, to, to ask for advice um, from other organizations or from other people, um, uh, you know, on a, on a, in a, in a, you know, in a very um, safe space, you know, for them to, to be, to be given like a path to say, you know, if I want to do something to do with, you know, with, with including more people in my organization, you know, what, what steps do I take? Um, so in, in terms of, you know, being kind of um, made, yeah, a token, I, I take responsibility for myself to say, actually, I, I don't think this, this one is for me. So when I was younger, it happened much more. It, it, it really did, you know, when, when I thought it's so great for me to be at a front cover of a prospectus or something like this. Um, but when I realized there's actually uh, not really an influx of, of, of more black students coming into, into the organization or things like that, and, and I've been there for years and I see no change, then, you know, that was um, a huge realization for me. So um, I think I think it's important to really understand the, the core belief of, of, of the organization. And then, and then you can offer yourself as a supporter of it uh, or not. Um, so yeah, every, every time I play for somebody, every time I, I want to be involved somewhere, I ask myself, you know, what are you, what are you trying to say to people? Um, uh, and I, I think for me, you know, I, my dream is to, is to bring South African or African young black musicians to, to the classical music realm, but also as, as natural improviser, uh, improvisers that they are, uh, to be a part of, of, of their like, DNA and a part of their, um, their, you know, their, their makeup. Um, because uh, if, if, you, if you don't use what you have from your home, then it, it kind of, uh, you, you're just learning academically. So I, I find that I'm now using what I have and it's just, I just love it because nobody else is doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's quite important to, to support people to be able to do that. And, and um, do you, yeah, just coming to a place you, and just being yourself. Yeah. So, sorry, Abel, do you feel like with those organizations that you work with, you've been allowed to or been supported to be yourself as you've explained? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, some yes, some not. Uh, but it's important to, to kind of know that, you know, there's something there that's, that's just yours and nobody else's and, and to cultivate that you need to go, you know, to, to all ends. Um, but there has been, you know, uh, some, some organizations that have really supported me and say, you know, we can get in anybody you want, uh, you just take the, the lead. But I, uh, it's not often because, um, you know, we're dealing with, with um, institutions that, that uh, kind of make, um, you know, one size fits all sometimes, you know. So as a classical musician, you, you, you'd be expected, you know, to have maybe four parts in, in a career, to be an orchestral musician, to be a soloist, to be a chamber musician, or to be a teacher, you know. And, and those, those are, seem to be, to be quite restrictive for me. So I, I felt like if I made my own thing, I could, I could do a lot of those and, and bring my influence to chamber music and write my own music that, that influences, you know, in an African style and a classical style and then take it to different festivals that are, are very different, you know, um, and, uh, and I can teach this, uh, you know, to, to different organizations and to younger people. And actually, I think it's, it's even more amazing that there'll be young people learning to improvise and play classical music at the same time. And that's mind blowing for me because I'm only discovering it now, you know. Um, and so that, that's, that's pretty exciting. So I think um, a one size fits all doesn't work anymore. And I think a lot of institutions are, are realizing that, you know, and I think to, to, to find out from, you know, from the people in your organization, what, what really inspires them and, you know, which directions they're looking is, is quite important. Um, and, and to not have, 
you know this this one one thing for everybody thank you very much um i'm gonna go over to rich and, and yvette now and um, probably kick off with you rich it's a, it's a chunky question so be prepared can you provide examples of how your organization ensures equitable opportunities and any practical thoughts on what does and doesn't work when trying to address inequality? All right, yeah. You, you I didn't write that you. because that's just too, that's too strong a question. So but, uh, I'll start with you, Rich, and then Yvette. You, you've got a bit of time to warm up and, and think about it. I think I'll need to hear it all again. <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to repeat it, Rich? Is, is, no, I to... think I got the short okay. screen going cool. first of this one. Um, okay, so <laughs> equitable opportunities, I heard that. Um, maybe I will have the question again, actually, you know, you're... Can you provide examples of how your organisation ensures equitable opportunities and any practical thoughts on what does and doesn't work when trying to address inequalities? Okay, yeah, so I mean, um, well, I mean, uh, attitude is everything, so we sort of wouldn't need to exist if there were uh, equitable opportunities for uh, deaf and disabled people. So, you know, obviously our long-term goal is to sort of put ourselves out of business um, and, you know, see, see a music industry that is, is um, kind of running as it should. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so how, how we do it is, is quite different, quite different because we ourselves don't offer, um, too many opportunities within our own organization. I, I have a network of artists, for example, um, but what that's about is about learning from those artists, um, giving them the opportunity to speak on panels and to be represented. Um, but I, but the way we work isn't about, um, I don't wanna provide um, more kind of equality and opportunities for artists by me making them, specifically making new opportunities for deaf and disabled artists. I, I don't think that that actually solves the, removes the barriers within the music industry. What we do is connect with the existing landscape, what's actually out there, the, the processes that are already happening for all artists. Um, so it was kind of interesting hearing Hannah talking earlier about that sort of being picked and unfortunately being picked maybe to be, to be playing gigs or to be in certain situations because you're um potentially supporting an organization's aim to like unfortunately tick some boxes um and um yeah i think that that's something that i'm i'm aware of um with with our work is that i don't want to have to create opportunities specifically for um disabled artists um uh, in a way because there aren't enough already it, it's sort of the the big challenge about for us is about going to the finding partners and working co collaboratively, which is, so that's how we work um, to, to provide those like opportunities. Um, I, I think I may have slightly wrestled that chunky question uh, uh, to the ground there a little bit, but if, if you feel like- I, 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 think, I think you've done, I think you've done a, a great job. It's in a, right. in a headlock. Now we can hopefully jump from the top rope and do some a leg, a leg drop on its leg. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to repeat it though, just okay. so I cover each corner. <laughs> Let, let's see if I can actually get my mouth around all these long words. Okay, so Yvette, can you provide examples of how your organization ensures equitable opportunities and any practical thoughts on what does and doesn't work when trying to address inequality? Okay, okay. So I go back to the fact, actually, I don't think I actually mentioned this first point implicitly. Jazz Refreshed is a black led organization created 18 years ago now for the specific reason to provide opportunities predominantly for black musicians who were not being given opportunities on the main gatekeeper stages in jazz. Um, so it, you're not necessarily young, but the majority obviously are young, you know, and as we've kind of gone through the years, we've brought younger, um, new young talent kind of, um, uh, into the network, into our family, um, and also to cultivate black audiences to bring them back to jazz. Because 18 years ago, UK jazz or jazz in the UK was very male, stale and pale. Um, so our focus has always been, about, and that's not only, you know, that was the objective, 
we do work with um, other cultures. We don't only work with black people. You know, we work with talent. We work with talent that we that connects with us, that connects with our spirit. We're not a conventional organization that just has a quota and will bring in people and put them on a, we have to feel you. We have to connect with you, with your talent. We have to truly believe that we can put our mouth on what you're doing and really kind of vouch for you out there in the universe. So just to kind of give you, that is why we exist. Um, um, so how we do it is to look at the landscape of talent, of black talent in the areas that they exist. Again, bear in mind, we are a small organization, so we cannot reach out to all the networks that we would want to because there are fundamentally four of us on payroll, one of whom is part time. Um, you know, we are a very small organization for all of the work that we do. We are still a very small organization. So we do what we can with the tools that we have and the capacity that we have. Um, so we, we talent scout, we look around. There is a, com there is a combination of looking at the organizations whose, whose output of talent we respect. Tomorrow's Warriors being the biggest one, of course, you know. Um, we try to create networks with other bodies and organizations as well. So for example, um, shout out Whiskers um, in Leeds, we're having conversations to do with the, the programs that they cultivate and work on out in Leeds. Um, he's looking at the um, kind of the jazz talent that comes through, sends us a pipeline of it through for us to review. We may decide actually none of it is for us, but we're looking at, you know, we're, we're tapping into various networks to see what connects with us us to see if we can create some opportunities because also it's really important at this point we were very London focused when we um, were first born but you know we've reached a point where we're trying to make sure we're reaching out you know all over the country we kind of jumped from London to all the international work that we do and kind of hadn't done everything in between and now we're focusing on everything in between as well um, so there are those kind of things so that's how we do it if that makes sense what does and doesn't work what doesn't work? Oh, sorry. The other thing that we do is we get lots of just submissions from artists that want to be considered and we go through all of it. It takes time, but we do. I say we, Adam Moses, he's our talent maker, um, our taste maker. He goes through all of it. And again, it's about what he connects with. You know, we trust his spirit. We trust what he feels when he feels the music. And it really is as, as you know, non-clinical as that. Um, so what does and doesn't work? Oh, goodness. Um, well, what does work is what we're doing, <laughs> to be honest with you. What, what does work is, you know, looking at um, um, the, the, the bodies that we have trust in, in their outputs. Um, what does work is sifting through the um, uh, uh, submissions that we get. What does work is listening to recommendations from other people, just seeing what is out on the landscape. Because don't forget, we're not training anyone to be a musician. You've already got that talent for us to want to work with you and help you onto the next stage of your career. That's kind of what we're about. Um, what doesn't work? I'm not really one to focus on the negative, to be honest with you. <laughs> but what, what doesn't work is, not connecting with your heart, not trusting your spirit. I guess that's that's where I would answer that. Nice poetic end there. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of, of the panel, but I did want to go around and give everyone maybe 60 seconds to kind of sum up a point. Obviously, this is the talent the, uh, development um, partnership and as people will be tuned in to kind of learn about how they should use data to better be inclusive or, you know, better their practice in, in regards to diversity. I want to know if there's one piece of advice you each individually will give to help them. So to formally ask the question, one, <laughs> what's one piece of advice you'd give to an organization or practitioners in our talent development partnership around utilizing data for the benefit of inclusivity and diversity? And I'll start with Hannah. Um, I would say just don't be afraid to, kind of what you were saying, Yvette, um, just, you know, being able to merge with other organisations, look at what they're doing and look who are attending their events, look who, um, the, the type of people that are going, you know, um, make sure that you're not excluding underrepresented people, that would be a huge one for me, um, in fact, go out of your way to make sure that you are including them. Don't just expect that they're gonna to come to you. 
go out of your way and target those people, find them and say, this is our organization, this is what we do. Um, would you be interested in joining or signing up? You know, don't just expect um, people to come to you. Um, and I would also say, you know, obviously with COVID, not really, you know, applicable right now, but don't, um, you know, just disregard actually talking to people face to face and saying, look, this is my, you know, survey. Um, would you feel comfortable filling it out, um, you know, at events or any sort of, um, you know, festival or networking event that your, that your organization is putting on? make sure to have physical copies, <laughs> you know, because I think people take the internet, like, you know, I, I, well, I would take the internet with a punch of salt is what I'm trying to say, you know, um, so as far as just providing a link, you know, some people just skim over that, you know, so make sure that you have some, uh, some physical copies as well to hand out, um, but yeah, I think that's me. Well, make sure you sanitize your hands when you're hand, handing out these <laughs> Able over to you. Any any piece of advice? One piece of advice you'd give? Yeah, um, you know, you had said something quite uh, poetic at the end about like not doubting your value. Um, that that a lot of organisations are, you know, of course they're not teaching music. I think they 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 they're looking for what you have. I think as an artist and as a practitioner, you you are standing in a place actually of advantage by. Uh, if you don't doubt your value and you 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 constantly realize your value, you know, uh, and and you can decide where you are most valuable and where you want to give the most. It's your choice, you know, uh, rather than the organization's choice that you are not being picked. I think you need to look yourself where you think you are most valuable. So, um, uh, you know, it's it's really important to also understand that um, excellence is not is not like um like the olden, for me anyway, it's not like the olden days where you, you practice, you know, 20 hours a day and you're just killing it all. I, I don't think that's that. I think it's, it's going inside yourself and realizing, you know, what are these parts of you that nobody else has? Um, and, and, and from that point, you know, that's, that's such a, a beautiful point to grow from where you can, you can really realize your value and, and where it's, it sits uh, in, in this really crazy landscape of organizations and music and identities. Um, find that first. I think that's really important. And I think nobody can take that away. And, and, and the more beautiful for other people you'll be uh, to, to, to be you know, attracted to. Thank you very much, Abel. Uh, Yvette? Um, okay, so I would start with the obvious. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Try something different, <laughs> you know, um, and, and as Hannah was saying, talk to others, get advice from others. Those who you see doing it well, ask them, don't be afraid. You know, the thing to be careful about um, um, is the whole tokenism thing. That's the thing to be really, really careful about. Nobody wants to be brought onto a program or into an organization to tick a box. No one wants to be made to feel that way either. So it's really important that you take your steps forward with the right attitude within yourself, as well as reaching out in the right way to the individuals. Because, you know, it's, we're, we're in a really, really interesting time where you know there is such a heavy focus i'm going to talk about black in particular obviously um there is such a heavy focus on black lives black lives matter the disparity the inequality but there is definitely without a doubt a level of organizations out there who are doing what they feel they should be doing to look right to look like they're following with the flow of energy that's happening at the moment and then there are those out there who truly feel it they truly feel it and they want to be part of that. Now, even before this whole focus on Black Lives Matter, as a black led organization, we've had to field a lot of that for our entire successful existence, the successful element where people suddenly decided that we were a successful organization to look at and to pay attention to. Suddenly, you know, there's this influx of white organizations wanting to partner with us you know and it's why why is it you want to partner with us do you know what i mean and some people there was a genuine energy around that and for some it was clear that we were helping them out of a bind you know and when it was clear the answer was no do you know what i mean so it's really really important that whatever intention you have 
um, is that use more than just the data in front of you. Make sure you kind of dive a bit deeper in there. Speak to people, understand people, get to know people. Don't just have it as facts and figures, um, but also whatever you decide to do, having taken advice from someone else, having seen how someone else does it successfully, do it with the right intention. I guess that. Last but not least, Rich. Yeah, following on from that there, um, there, are, there are stories and lots to learn behind what might look like numbers. If you're chasing, if you're chasing numbers, this is not the purpose of what any of us do or like why the why there's even a music industry in the first place. Um, shouldn't, you know, not, not really like lean on the negative side, but really have to focus on the benefits um, of, of the music and the art and 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 learn about what's going on behind those numbers like um the stories and the experiences with people um it's really important so you have to you have to listen in other ways um i think not and not just in the data that you're receiving there are other ways like qualitative ways of, of listening um and connecting with other organizations um but i think one thing i wanted to kind of end on saying was because obviously we're a disability led organization, but we're really mindful that like, when you're collecting data, it can be maybe a little bit um, appealing to sort of try and put people in certain boxes, think that like, okay, well, this is a disabled artist or a black artist um, or a female artist, but actually many people are combinations um, of like all these things that we're talking about, different conversations. And uh, we would really like, we're really striving at the moment to try and connect things together a bit more and appreciate that, you know, like we're all like, we're all not just one one thing. And it's um, it's often assumed like that you've kind of follow a narrative around like a disabled artist, but you know, I speak to many artists who are women or black disabled musicians and like, there's, there's, there's so much more going on. So you have to like listen beyond the numbers, I guess would be my parting message. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you very much, all. Uh, it's, it's been um, informative and entertaining, which is really good. I uh, hope that everybody who's paying attention has got something from it. But yeah, again, thank you all and hopefully see you all soon. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel Williams. I'm the Engagement Director at Youth Music. For those of you who don't know us, we're a national charity set up in 1999 to support young people's lives in music. Equity, diversity and inclusion are at the heart of what we do. We aim to break down barriers and equalise access to music for young people. We do this by working with the earliest years right up to the age of 25. We focus on those who might otherwise miss out on music because of who they are, where they live or what they're going through. As a funder, we invest in around 350 music projects each year. We work collaboratively with young people to design our programmes, make decisions on who we fund and campaign together to drive changes in music industries. We joined the Talent Development Partner Network last year. It's been so great to have connected with so many of you already and also to have provided additional investment for 12 TDP organisations, helping them to deliver some vital work supporting early year music creators. We're really pleased to be continuing our partnership with PRS Foundation into 2021. Over the last year at Youth Music, we've been significantly scaling up our support to help young people begin music careers and progress into the industries, either as artists and creators or as industry professionals. And more often than not, we're seeing as a real mix of these young creatives wearing many, many different hats. We believe that forming this realistic understanding of what a career in music in 2021 actually involves needs to start as early as possible and come from those who are currently active in music and best understand it. The more these possibilities and realities are discussed, the more all young people can consider them and learn how to navigate their own journeys. We released a report last year called A Blueprint for the Future. This collected and analysed over 1,300 young people's experiences of trying to start a career in music pre-pandemic. This showed that someone's income background or their social class 
was the biggest factor in determining whether they were actually earning any money from music and were able to see a future career in the industry. This then further intersected with gender, ethnicity, disability and location, which increased the disadvantage for underrepresented communities in those in suburban areas. As we rebuild following the pandemic, we need to ensure the music industries are accessing the widest possible pool of talent. Now, I'm sure everyone's heard these phrases before, but we truly believe this is the point where we really need to get beyond this rhetoric and the warm words and move to actions. Start giving funding and power to those who have historically been underrepresented. So there's two ways that Youth Music is going to be doing this over the next year. We already launched our incubator fund in summer 2020 and we'll be running two further rounds of this in 2021. This fund offers organisations funding to work with underrepresented young creatives and give them the chance to deliver a collaborative project, giving them autonomy and ownership, really investing in their ideas. Half of the money, half of that funding must go into the pockets of the 18 to 25s, either through a wage, a commission or a grant. And it's been really great to see a few of the TDP organisations getting involved in this already and we hope lots more will look at the fund. The next deadline is the 5th of February. To complement that, later this year we'll be launching a new programme offering funding and support directly to young people for the first time in youth music's history. This will give grants of up to £5,000 to 18 to 25 year olds to deliver their own creative projects. We're super excited about the potential here and to be working together with the TDP network to address these significant challenges. We must ensure that we're targeting our support based on evidence for those facing the greatest barriers to music making. And not only that, but we challenge and change our own organisational practices to create a more just and equitable music ecosystem. So if you want to find out more about our work, do talk to us across the conference, drop us an email, grants at youthmusic.org.uk, tweet us at youthmusic, and we're also on Instagram at youthmusiccharity. Enjoy the rest of the sessions and hopefully catch up soon. Thanks.